you're looking at M48 Patton, the US Army tank that was in service between 1953 and 1990 and actually participated in quite a lot of various conflicts around the world. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at this tank and seeing how it changed the history of the world. We're going to be using a game called Armored Warfare and another game called War Game Red Dragon to try to recreate one of the battles from history and also try to use this tank as the main battle force. This is What The Math, a channel where we'll learn about history, science and math using video games. Welcome and enjoy the video. And let's start with the basics and various features of this tank. So one of the more coolest uh, features of M48 is that it's one of the most upgraded tanks uh, US ever had. This tank has been changed and modified so many times that it's really hard to keep track of all of them. Um, it uh, changes cannon many times, it changes appearance, it actually had a huge uh, upgrade of its armor as well. And one country in the world actually used this tank uh, for many years and has changed it to such an effect that it doesn't even look like the original tank anymore. And that country is Israel. This is the country where we're going to be talking about today in a little bit more detail. But first, let's actually talk a little bit more about the actual tank. Now, obviously, this tank is named after General George Patton, the commander of US Third Army uh, during the Second World War. And... Uh, this main battle tank served in the US Army and also the Marine Corps um, as the primary main battle tank uh, during many wars, but specifically during the Vietnam War, along some of the other tanks that US had. And it went through some major modifications uh, with the last model being M48A5 model that completely redesigned a lot of uh, different features of the tank, making it a lot more durable and obviously giving it a much larger cannon as well and this was actually in the 80s uh, almost uh, 30 years after its first release now the us doesn't actually use these tanks anymore but many other countries still do and uh, sp specifically the turkish army still has the largest number of modernized m48 tanks as one of their main battle tanks they actually have something like uh, 1400 of these tanks it's over a thousand m48s that are still used in turkey today and the three major conflicts where this tank was used quite extensively are the Vietnam War, where it actually supported the South Vietnamese forces against the North Vietnamese invasion, and usually had to f uh, face tanks from the Soviet Union, such as PT-76 tank that we talked about in the previous video, and also T-55 tanks that we also discussed before. It also participated in Indo-Pakistani wars, where it was actually on the side of Pakistan and um, was facing a lot of the Soviet tanks that India had, and unfortunately in that war it didn't really perform as admirably as it could. But the biggest battles that this tank has seen were in the Middle East, where it was actually used by both the Israelis and the Arabs, and actually had to face a variety of tanks, anything from the World War II uh, T-34 tanks to the more modern T-55 tanks and also tank destroyers from the Soviet Union, as well as the Centurion tanks uh, from England, which were actually probably the most modern tanks of that era. All right, so let's actually talk about the one of the conflicts where this tank was widely used. And like I mentioned before, um, there were many conflicts where this was uh, the main battle tank, but one in particular was the Six Day War between Israel and the Arab states. Now, in the, one of the future videos, I'm going to go in the background uh, behind this war and why it actually occurred and why Israel and the Arab states were actually at each other's throats. Um, but this war was important for Israel to kind of establish security for their newly created nation and also to prove themselves to their neighbors as someone who could just hold their ground on their own without anyone's help. Now before we talk about the actual war, so Israel was essentially created in, right after the World War II and it was actually a proposal by the General Assembly of the United Nations in, in 1947 where they basically proposed to create an independent Arab state and also an independent Jewish state as well as the city of Jerusalem um, as a kind of a refuge for a lot of the um, Jewish immigrants from other countries and obviously as a result of the Holocaust in Germany. 
And as I mentioned, we're going to go into detail about this in one of the future videos. But for now, all you need to know is that at this point, the Arab states surrounding Israel, specifically Egypt, Jordan and Syria, really didn't like Israel. They actually didn't want them there. And they actually had few pre previous conflicts in that area as well. And the first conflict they had was in 1948. There was actually a big war between the countries which Israel happened to win. And for almost 20 years after this, Israel was always under constant threat from much bigger neighbors uh, that surrounded it. So if you look at the map here, you'll notice that Israel is actually completely surrounded by its essentially enemies. So there's Lebanon, Syria, which were not really friendly with it. There's Jordan that would always support the other Arab states. And there was Egypt that was really, really against Israel. And because Israel was obviously aware of this and they actually used uh, their intelligence services to try to make sure that they're aware of any kind of deployment of forces or potential future war, they made sure that they were prepared for anything. So they've made applications to the, the United States to try to purchase as much weaponry as they could. And uh, in 1955, they actually tried to purchase 60 of um, M47 tanks, which were the previous versions of M48 tanks. And eventually they managed to actually get an agreement with the United States. And the US really wanted to actually sell the Patton, M48 Patton tanks to Israel. However, because of several other agreements, uh, they were not able to openly sell them from the US stock. So they actually had to try to figure out a deal where they could transfer the tanks using another country. And this country was Germany. Actually, West Germany agreed to sell tanks to Israel by first purchasing them from the US. And this is how Israel was able to get um, something like 150 of M48 first version tanks uh, for their arsenal. And at this point, uh, these tanks were probably as modern as they could get. They could easily face anything that Soviet Union would throw at them, specifically T-55 tanks. And they would um, actually perform quite, uh, quite well on the battlefield as long as they were facing a similar type of a force. And so Israel was kind of ready for any kind of a conflict, but um, in the summer of 1967, uh, the Israeli intelligence reported that something was happening on their borders. Jordan and uh, Egypt started to mobilize their forces and amassing a huge force, a really, really big force, way bigger than anything Israel had on uh, borders. Uh, and specifically for Egypt, this was the Sinai Peninsula, and for Jordan, it was the entire border, and Israel started to really get worried. This forest buildup actually reminded Israel that obviously they had a lot of enemies around them, and there might be actually another push from the Arab forces to try to destroy the state of Israel and recreate the Arab state in that region. And during that time, and actually in May of 1967, the Egyptian president actually demanded that uh, the UN peacekeeping forces, or uh, they were actually known as emergency force at that point, uh, were uh, would actually leave that area. He actually asked for them to leave, meaning that he was preparing for war. At the same time, Egyptian Navy also blockaded some of the regions of Mediterranean and prevented the Israeli ships from passing. And lastly, on May 30th of 1967, Jordan actually joined the Egyptian-Syrian military alliance and uh, Israel found out about it, meaning that they were definitely preparing for war. And so at this point, Arab troops actually had almost 500,000 troops and almost 3,000 tanks and 800 aircraft ready to strike at Israel. And at this point, Israel only had about 50,000 troops um, and they had 300 aircraft and 800 tanks. So they were actually one-eighth of the entire forest. But to add to all of this, uh, the Egyptian president, uh, Nasser, refused to actually recognize Israel, but also called for its complete destruction. So Israel was definitely at the brink of the war. They knew about it. The Arabs knew about it. So at this point, Israel had to act. And this actually led to the development of the new Israeli military doctrine of preemptive strikes. So they've actually developed this doctrine on the premise of if the war is inevitable, they're going to be the first to strike to try to eliminate as many of the enemy's forces as possible because obviously they were always overwhelmed and, and always outnumbered by their enemies. So on June 5th of 1967, Israel did something absolutely incredible. They've launched 200 of their own aircraft and they made them fly really low over the Mediterranean Sea and over the Red Sea, uh, basically preventing them from being detected by the radar, and then attacked Egyptian air bases, completely annihilating the Egyptian air force. Now, this was probably the most successful 
airstrike mission ever. They've managed to eliminate over 350 airplanes from Egypt and completely destroy their airfields, preventing them from using those airfields for the rest of the war. And so with only 20 Israeli planes lost and 180 still in action, and completely eliminating Egyptian air force, they were now able to use their airplanes to support any kind of a strike. And so following this attack on June 5th, Nasser, the Egyptian president, um, asked Syria and Jordan to begin attacks on Israel so that they could then try to attack them from their side as well. But because there was so much confusion and miscommunication between the Arab states, and because Israel was uh, acting with lightning-like speed at trying to attack everyone and eliminate every threat, they were actually able to overcome all of these enemies. So first they attacked uh, or counterattacked Jordan by launching an offensive and essentially encircling East Jerusalem, completely conquering this area and also seizing the West Bank and some of the other cities around that area. And of course this was only about two or three days of fighting. They then focused on Syria, uh, launching airstrikes and also destroying two-thirds of Syrian air force while taking the Golan Heights area from the Syria and forcing Syrians to retreat. But then, of course, they would focus on Egypt, which was the biggest force in this region. With Syria and Jordan out of the picture, they essentially pushed through the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula and they used their main armed force for this. And this is what you see me recreating here. So we have our M48 tanks, we have our airplanes, and here I'm using the French Mirage airplanes, which uh, Israel actually had. And we're also using the AMX-13 tanks as our um, reconnaissance units, just to simulate that um, Israelis actually had a little bit more in terms of intelligence and in terms of being able to detect enemy forces than Egypt or their enemies. And so the enemy that we're actually facing here will not have any recon, but they will have a huge amount of tanks. I've given uh, Egypt a lot of T-55 tanks, a lot of T-38 uh, modernized tanks. They also have SU-100 tank destroyers and artillery pieces, and they have lots and lots of infantry. So we're actually facing a force that's about three times bigger than what we have ourselves. And all we have are M-48 patents and uh, Air Force. And the thing is, the M48 tank was actually renamed in Israel to Magach, which is Israeli for the Chariot of War Heroes. Uh, it's, it's sort of a short of abbre abbreviation for this um, sentence and essentially refers to the fact that this was their main battle tank. And of course, they were really proud to use it in the war against the Arab states. Now, Magach tanks were uh, upgraded quite a lot. They were modernized almost uh, every few years and they went through a lot of modifications up to the point of of Magach 7, which was actually a much more modernized tank you see right here. So this is essentially the same tank, but with a lot of modifications. And so the main effort of the Israeli armor was directed toward Egypt and specifically toward the Sinai Peninsula. And the Egyptians had approximately 100,000 soldiers stationed here with about 1,000 tanks and lots of artillery pieces. Israel, however, had a much smaller force, but they decided to use a really interesting technique here of trying to encircle their enemy and destroy them in little pockets. And specifically, they would use uh, the armored units to try to push through, surround the enemy, and then try to encircle and eliminate them. But what I'm trying to simulate here using war game um, Red Dragon is essentially the breakthrough. So we're going to be using uh, two different sides to approach the enemy. And uh, essentially, we're, we're trying to eliminate them by using superior air force and superior intelligence, try to detect the enemy before they detect us, uh, eliminate them, and then advance forward. And just to keep the element of surprise, what the Israeli did is they actually maintained radio silence until the last possible moment before the attack. And so Egyptian forces were really surprised by such a sudden attack. And so within two days, the uh, Israeli forces under General Tal, who was actually one of the in more infamous generals in Israel, um, were able to make progress and proceed towards Suez Canal and essentially in these two strikes uh, along the north and south axes, they were able to engage Egyptian forces in heavy combat, um, overtake them and proceed further toward the border with Egypt. And with so many uh, air force attacks coming in every second, the Egyptians had to retreat. They had no choice but to retreat because they didn't really have much um, anti-air weapons at that point and their air force was out of service. And so within four days, by 8th of June 1967, 
the Egyptian forces uh, on Sinai Peninsula were completely defeated. And this was actually their main force as well. So General Tao's forces uh, managed to conquer the entire Suez Canal and also the entire Sinai Peninsula. And although this war only really took six days in total, which is why it's called the Six Day War, it was actually very important for Israel and for its neighbors because, well, first of all, it showed that or demonstrated that Israel was able to, and willing to take any kind of a strategic strike and could uh, essentially change the regional balance uh, if it was threatened by other countries. But, but at the same time, this obviously angered the Egyptians and Syrians that were, uh, they felt humiliated, that they, they felt devastated and they needed to try to reclaim some of the lost territory. And because of this, of course, Israel is often seen as the aggressor and is also portrayed as the invader and also as the enemy of the Palestinian state. But I think people often forget how it all started and how this all came to be, because if it wasn't for Egypt, Syria, Lebanon and Jordan threatening Israel for so many years, I don't think we would have gotten to the state where we are right now. But nevertheless, despite the Israeli victory, they obviously didn't really make many friends uh, overseas because to other countries this seemed like a preemptive strike that was actually a declaration of war from the side of Israel. So only the United States supported Israel during that time, but other countries, especially the Soviet countries, uh, the Soviet bloc countries, except for I think Romania, uh, broke off relations with Israel, calling them the invaders and supporting the Arab states instead. And this of course was one of the few major wars that Israel was going to have with the Arab states and there were quite a lot more to come. We'll talk about these wars in the future and we'll also talk about how this all ended and what this all means for us today. But of course as you can see in this video M48 tanks or Magach tanks as they're known in Israel are actually admirable opponents to all of the Soviet tanks that Soviet Union had at that time. And I think in this particular battle, I only lost very few of them because I was able to support them with my air force and I was also able to use my reconnaissance units to detect the enemy before they get to me. But in reality, after the Six Day War, um, Israel lost something like 900 people and 400 tanks were destroyed, but not many of those tanks were M48s. And so yes, this was the Six Day War in a nutshell and this is how Israel was able to prove its identity and also to prove its military power to the Arab states and obviously to the other countries around the world. And of course this upset many countries and of course it, it also put Israel in a very difficult situation where now it actually made enemies of all of the Arab states around them but also caused the Soviet Union and its allies to reject them as well. But at the same time, this helped Israel become closer to the United States and, and also gave Israel as a country the idea that the only way for them to survive and the only way for them to maintain their state is to actually maintain really good intelligence services, be able to use reconnaissance and of course be ready for the preemptive strike if ever it was needed again. And although not everyone would agree that Israel did the right thing, uh, I think personally if they didn't actually strike Egyptian forces first and if they didn't start the war the way they did, uh, by now uh, Israelis would have been eliminated and it's very likely that we would be facing yet another holocaust. Because at that point the Arab states actually wanted to completely destroy Israel and eliminate it from the face of earth. But from the military perspective this was actually a really interesting way of achieving victory with minor forces with very very little advantage and really the only advantage that Israel had was the air force. And of course by using highly mobile, well-trained forces that would actually use a lot of maneuver tactics to try to outsmart and outperform their enemies and of course by trying to isolate their enemies into little pockets which could then be destroyed. So all in all this is actually one of the more successful military missions of the 20th century and to be honest I think this is probably one of the more successful missions M48 has actually seen. And with so many new M48 tanks captured Israel was able to replenish its stocks and create a new version of Magach that would then continue to be its main battle tank that would actually protect its borders. Well that's really it for the Six Day War and for how M48 Patton influenced the history. And in the next video, we're going to be continuing this topic and talk about yet another tank. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please share it with your friends and also like this video. 
check out some of the other history through video games videos right here and also don't forget to subscribe and if you would like to learn through video games and you like the idea of learning by watching youtube videos make sure to subscribe and check out some of these other videos that i made about the history of space flight and also using math and science in video games thank you so much for watching game you later and bye bye